order. So welcome to our information session number four. Um, and this one's going to be focused around our changing climate. So this is the first session where we start to actually unpick some of those challenges. And the first one of that being climate change. So last week in our housing session, and all of these um, will be recorded. We have a phone recording today, but they'll be recorded and put up online as well for you to um, check or share later with other people who aren't, aren't able to make it today. But last time we heard about the four wellbeings and the role that that has in urban development. And today we're now going to do a deeper dive into climate change and our environment. So one of the four wellbeings. And as we saw this week, especially on Monday with the heavy rain, it showed just how quickly the effect of our climate can have on our urban area and our homes. So this needs to be considered very carefully as we plan for growth here in Rotorua. So to set the scene for this information series, um, one of many housing sessions, um, Rotorua is dealing with a housing crisis. So evidence shows that our city has a severe lack of homes and council is working with urgency to respond to that demand here in Rotorua. So Rotorua is growing and as we grow we'll continue to change. But as we do, we need to be ready and to be able to act now as well. So it's about preparing and planning well to act as soon as possible. So our community in Rotorua now has the opportunity to plan for a future that enables our city to grow in a way that protects but also enhances those things that we love. So we don't want Rotorua to be a victim of growth. We don't want that victim mentality. There is actually plenty of opportunities that are coming from this and we're going to be ready for them. So the housing crisis is universal. It's not just being experienced here um, in Rotorua, but across the country. But we do have some challenges that are unique to us here in our home of Rotorua, and we will respond to them. So Rotorua is actually in a good position to act on the growth that we are experiencing. And we can learn from other cities and be rest assured that for the Rotorua Lakes Council, housing has become one of our top priorities. So as we um, divert our attention to that one aspect of it around the environment and climate change, I'd now like to welcome um, our councillor, Fisher Wynn, um, who leads the climate change uh, portfolio and mahi here within council. So I hand to him and then he'll pass on to our guest speakers today. Kia ora Tanya, thank you. Um, tēnā koutou uh, Council's role is to enable and encourage growth and to build partnerships with those who can deliver what we need to help our community thrive. And because of that, we, can, we can't do this alone. Everyone needs to work together to help Rotorua reach its potential as a great place to live, to work, to play and to invest. We want, every, we want people who love Rotorua to be involved in the plans we make to build the city everyone can and wants to live in. Council acknowledges the importance of partnering with Mana Whenua. Council is, is committed to working together to ensure the values and principles of Te Arawa underpin all conversations about growth, housing, well-being and environment. Now today we have a very action-packed session um, first up we have Nick Newman, the Principal Advisor in Environmental Strategy with support from Mark Townsend, the Engineering Manager and Cathy Thiel Larden from the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. They're going to provide an overview of the inputs of climate change on our district, then discuss the assessment exercise they have been through and finally we will have a more detailed look at the, the challenges with the Bitahina stream. Then we will have Lani Kiriopa, Climate Change Coordinator from Te Arawa Lakes Trust, to provide an overview of Te, te Araki Kopu, followed by questions afterwards. Then I'll be back up with ta uh, Councillor Tanya Tapsell to wrap up what else we are doing. So now I'd like to hand over the reins to Nick. Um, thank you for having us in your place. Um, myself, uh, Mark and Kathy are going to um, cover off the next, um, next piece together. We really um, wanted to hone in um, this conversation uh, through the lens of growth and housing, which is the, the co of, of, of this talk, but we're going to talk specifically about climate change and what challenges. 
challenges and opportunities you might face, and we'll talk about the region, the district, the city, and some very specific um, impacts. So we're going to drill down as we go. So in 2019, we commissioned NIWA to uh, downscale national projections for climate change to our region. And the infographic you can see here is a summary of those impacts for the region, which I'll go through um, in a minute. We've also uh, got a video that's been made of this, a four minute video, which you can find on the web link there, as well as the full NIWA technical report. But just picking up on some of the highlights, or the lowlights, um, <coughs> For example, hot days in our region, just from a region-wide perspective, are projected to increase from 32 hot days a year over 25 degrees, to close to 100 hot days a year over 25 degrees by the end of the century. This will depend a little bit on where you are in the region, and we'll talk about that in a moment. This goes to a point which um, Council Taps have made about the full well-beings, that climate impacts are not just going to be on the environment, this heat then flows through potentially to health and well-being of our elderly people. So those are the kind of downstream impacts on the full well-beings that we need to think about. In terms of frost days, those are projected to decrease as the century goes on and as the climate warms, with a particular impact, of course, on primary, primary sector production. And again, it varies across the region. It's already been touched on, but extreme rainfall events are projected to become more frequent and as a warming atmosphere holds more water, more intense. Sea level rise, you don't need to worry about it. So we'll put that one in the bank. Uh, I'm going to keep going down from region wide. We're going to get more and more specific. If you want to follow up on any of this, just note the, note the web link there. In terms of those hot days, as an example, just drilling in a little bit more, we have turned the NIWA projections into some interactive maps. You can put in your address and then it will zoom in to where you are in the region. And then for this one here, for the hot days, you can see um, Rotorua. That's my shade that I'm pointing. Um, historically, you've had um, about 15 to 20 hot days per annum. By the end of the century, that could be up at 70 or 80 hot days per hour. So the scale of change is, is evident there on the maps. There are a number of variables which we've got these maps produced for. Another one is potential evapotranspiration deficit, which is like a drought um, index. You can see historically for Rotorua on the far left, um, quite low. By the end of the century, if we carry on with the emissions that we're currently producing, that drought risk is significant. <coughs> In terms of the, the wider district, with a warmer, a warmer climate, potentially more wind, then that's going to increase the fire risk, particularly for forestry in your district. Uh, we'd like to see risks around water quality, particularly if the lakes are warming and the impact that might have on lake ecology. Also, if we're getting bigger extreme events, then they will pick up more contaminants, which of course end up in the lakes. So, pressure on lake water quality. And also, the range of pests and diseases as the climate warms, then they increase their range. So, that coupled with some of those other, other risks in terms of primary production and the time of the That's the, that's, the, that's the overview from, from, from region down to district. Now Mark and Kathy are going to talk about um, one particular um, hazard in particular. Um, yeah, as Matt said, I'm, I'm Mark Townsend. I'm the engineering manager at the Bay County Regional Council. And I, part of that role as engineering manager, I, I'm in charge of flight management. Um, <coughs> moving on, what I'm going to do is just give you an overview of the work that we're doing in terms of the assessments of those climate change effects that, that Nick talked about. So that's the flooding bit. So on that first slide, it was the bits, the blue bits down the bottom. 
um, with that intense rainfall and what effect that has um, on our lakes and then also on the streams which um, primarily flow into Lake Wetter River. So, you can't see that, can you? <laughs> Um, so what, are, what I'm going to just in general uh, talk about is obviously we've got uh, many lakes in this region. Uh, we have two different types of lakes for the purposes of this discussion. There's lakes that have natural outlets into other lakes and into, into rivers and streams and then there's others that effectively have no um, outlet. So what we anticipate, and you'll see the date there that we're not expecting to have the results from this climate change assessment for the lakes until late in this year, but what we are expecting is those lakes that have no outlet, there's going to be more effect than those that do have an outlet. It's biologically, there's going to be less effect. I'm going to talk in, in specifically uh, on this slide about Lake Rotorua and Lake Rotoiti to try and dispel some myths that are, that are, that are out there. So I'm just going to point to a couple of, couple of locations. The Ohau Channel, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And then of course the, the Okiri Gates, which then flow down to uh, the Kaituna. So first of all, in terms of the Okiri Gates, um, there's a consent in place uh, where, whereby the flow going through the Okiri Gates is greater than the flow that comes through the Ohau Channel. And that's, that's driven by water quality, so that there's no reflux, so there's none of the Lake Rotorua water <coughs> that goes into Rotoiti. And that's, that's one of the, the outcomes that was agreed with the community at the time to improve the water quality in Rotoiti. So what, what that means is that um, <coughs> in terms of water flowing into Rotoiti from Rotorua, the restriction is not has nothing to do with gates, because the gates, is, as I said, is taking more flow than what's coming in. So the restriction for Rotorua is the Ohau Channel itself. Now that comes back to the Ohau Channel, and we've got what we call the Ohau Channel Weir, which was uh, installed quite some time ago, uh, in the late, late 70s, early 80s. And the function of that weir, again agreed with the community, is around maintaining the lake levels in Lake Rotorua during dry times. And it was driven by, by access. And so we've got, a, we've got a weir there, which is a series of, of three boards, which are about so high and they're sort of staggered. And they have the effect of um, maintaining the level in those dry periods. And it has an effect of keeping the water up about 150 mils. When we get high lake levels, there's a trigger and we go through and we remove those, um, those stop logs, as we call them, and then we go back to the normal flow in the OER channel. There was talk, I think, in 2017, and where we had quite high lake levels out here, but the regional council was holding water in the lake. No. As, as explained, it's all around the capacity of our, our channel. We'll move now on to the, into the streams that um, flow into uh, Lake Rotorua. Um, so the, the six streams that, that are up there are, are ones that are part of our our asset management plan, and it's our part of our flood protection. So I'll just, just highlight a couple of things. So in terms of each of those streams, we maintain flood protection basically to the to the main road. So if you look at the Waititi and the Nongata, and also the Waipira, it's essentially the Nongata road is where we maintain flood protection. Upstream of that, we have what we call a maintenance regime. And we don't provide flood protection, but we pull the trees out that have fallen in and, and maintain banks and so forth. As we, as we move around, we've got the, the Utahina, and the Utahina we maintain um, to uh, Old Taupo Road, and then again upstream of there up to Pukahangi, we've got the maintenance regime as well. Um, move around to the Puringa, it's, it's the main road, or uh, Ngātai Road, um, same with the Wainahi as well, and again um, further up we maintain um, yeah, as, as far as trees, etc. are concerned. You'll see there that uh, we're well underway with um, the work on the streams. There's two components to the work we do. It's, the first component is what we call the hydrology. So that's what is the effect of this increased rainfall, how much water is now flowing into these streams. And then the second part we do is what we call the hydraulic assessment, which is once that water's in there, what effect does it have? Does the, does the stream and the flood protection, does that provide enough capacity for that increase? 
free supply. So just working our, excuse me, working our way through the streams um, for the Y to T, uh, we've completed the hydrology, and you can see there that we're, we're then moving into the next financial year, so 1st of July, we move into the hydraulic assessment. In terms of the Nonga to Ha, obviously there's quite a bit of work that's been going on there post um, April 2018. Uh, so, that, so the hydrology is done, the model's done, and we're working with the community on solutions and, and the affected landowners in particular right now. Uh, the Whaipero, uh, we're um, uh, just completing the, uh, the hydrology, and again we're into the hydraulic um, capacity from next year. Uh, the Utahina, I won't talk too much about that because I'll, I'll steal Kathy's thunder, she's going to give you a whole lot more detail, that's the most advanced model that we've got. So leave that one for now. Um, the pudding the hydrology's done, we're about 80% through the hydraulic um, modelling and so we're hoping to have that um, very shortly for the sharing with uh, initially RLC and then out to the community. Uh, and then the Wainahi is in the same boat, although there is a bit of a, a stall there associated with um, working with a potential development. So. so I'll leave it there and then I'll hand on to Cathy. <laughs> Um, I'm the Senior Environmental Engineer um, for Regional Council and my role um, for the Utahina catchment, um, I've been the project manager for that uh, analysis. Um, as Mark said, um, we have a, a big program in front of us and the Utahina was the first one of uh, the ranks. Um, the job that we are <coughs> undertaking is the global uh, river run flooding asset analysis. The model that flows um, within the Utahina stream and its tributaries, the Monte Carlo stream and the Utahina stream through the urban um, what is river run flooding? River run flooding happens when rivers um, and streams reach their capacity and flow outside their usual course and overspill uh, beyond their banks into the flood plain, which in return can create a hazard. Um, the model has preliminary built to undertake a capacity review of the stream itself, uh, in particular for the lower Utahina flood protection scheme. Downstream of World Tower Road, sort of the orange line I'm showing. Um, but we also wanted to be able to assess the relative impacts uh, of climate change and um, any potential flood mitigation measures um, on a catchment wide scale. Um, and, and able to do that, we uh, expanded our flood model. Um, previously, it was just below state Highway 5. We now extended our flood model to shown here in the green area. Um, secondary purpose uh, is to provide information um, on areas susceptible to river run flooding for emergency planning, um, to provide flood level advice for new buildings um, in the vicinity of the streams or close vicinity, uh, and then also to provide boundary conditions for water water leaks, stormwater and access. Um, the analysis that we have undertaken um, looks at extreme rainfall events. So that's events like a 2%, 1% or 0.2% annual extreme probability events. Um, and we looked at the current climate and then also the future climate. And that future climate is based on the business as usual climate change, so the emissions are going to stay as currently. The maps we present here show the expected changes um, to the maximum water depth during the 1% annual exceedance probability event. Um, what does it mean? We're basically looking at a 1 in 100 chance of this event taking place uh, in any one year. So in the future, the same probable event um, has a higher range of intensities and in return results in higher flood peaks and greater storm volume. Based on these maps, uh, we can identify the scale of the potential impact that climate change uh, alone is likely to have um, on this catchment in the future. So if we look at the picture to the left, so 
that's uh, the event of today's program. Um, we can see here that some spilling of the stream uh, already happens uh, in Chomodiro Street, and uh, most people are probably aware um, of those spillings. Um, and then also around Sunset Road, there's only Uchimatea in the middle there, so there's um, restrictions uh, in culvert sizes, um, the, the flow can't um, pass. And then also in the lower Yudhena, um, there's already spilling happening. If you look at the picture in the middle, which is about 20 years from now, it's not far to go. Um, we already experience a uh, way greater flooding extent. Um, it is predicted that the old harbour road and also uh, Lake Road uh, by that time um, during the 1% event will overtop and also spill into um, the urban environment and industrial land. Um, and then lastly we have the 100 year um, in about 100 years time which is here on the right. Um, significant flooding is predicted in the lower reaches. And then also we can see some further flooding up in the Utah now right here, um, which is significant. Um, we would like to note some limitations of our study. So we have, um, for the study, there's no allowance for direct localized rainfall. So it's the rain that falls on the, to the hard surface and makes their way into the stormwater network. And then also the pipe surges. So if, if it can't get into the stormwater network <coughs> because of blockages, because of the streams are being up high, that water has to run over land somehow. Um, that's not shown within these maps. Um, we also didn't allow any intensification um, to happen in, in these predictions yet, um, and because uh, with any intensification you will have an increase in impervious areas, uh, more water that will run off and not being able um, to get into the ground. Um, and then lastly, at this point we haven't allowed for any uncertainties within the model itself. So there, there's uh, certain predictions that a model can't calculate. And for that, we usually allow um, in, in allowance that uh, uh, we put on when we look for flood um, levels. Um, human interaction was in the floodplain, and the associated exposure to the flood hazards was in the floodplain can create hazardous um, conditions. And it could be either a combination of um, a small, fast-flowing uh, water or deep, slow-flowing water. Both of them have different hazards associated with them. Um, and it really only becomes a risk when we put humans in there. Um, so while the study doesn't provide a fulsome assessment of what the future might bring regarding flood risk on a city-wide scale, um, it is an essential input for the World Ex Council when looking at the upcoming plan changes in regards to flooding and also intensification. So what what council must do? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, they need to ensure that uh, new development is located outside of hazardous conditions. That development does not adversely alter the flow and conveyance or the storage areas of the streams. And then also that new development doesn't increase the risk to the existing development. And for me, I'd like to um, give it back to Nick to just give a recap. And, um, That's great. I'm sure, um, sure we have some questions. Uh, just letting you put um, some challenges and opportunities. I guess you've just been through this, but that, that increasing flood risk, the challenge of how the city um, deals with that with new development in terms of not increasing that and increasing the risk and making things, making more places exposed and potentially places that are already exposed to the worse. And also with the existing development you've got, how that development can adapt to the changing environment. 
And also there's a challenge about how you grow the city and reduce emissions at the same time. We're talking here about adaptation to climate change, but for the mitigation picture, we know that we need to be reducing our emissions and we're growing, so that's a challenge. In terms of opportunities, and this maybe goes back to the very start, you know, there's a, there's a I guess you've got it in your hands now in terms of um, thinking about your development being climate resilient. So building that resilience and going beyond not making things worse but building resilience into your design and a building emissions reduction into your city design. And also there's a great opportunity with a, with a unique place like Rotorilla for local leadership and creative solutions. Thank you. Nick, thank you, Mark and Kathy. Um, I think we see from, thank you for your presentation firstly, and we see from that the importance of collaboration and partnership between all the, our organisations together. Um, all these challenges, but also many other opportunities out there as well. Um, it further cements that we can't do this alone and we do need that partnership forward. Um, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council team will be here uh, at the end to answer some questions that you may have as well after Lani's presentation. Now a couple of weeks ago you may remember we had Nikki Douglas remotely presenting to our Te Arawa Vision and Values session. Uh, today we have Lani Kiriopa joining to provide an overview of Te Arawa's climate strategy. Lani Kriopa is Ngāti Whakaue and lives amongst her Fano and Hapu on her papakainga within Ohanamu Tūpā. She is passionate about protecting the culture, community lifestyle and restoring the water boundary, Ngāwha, wetlands, indigenous taonga species, food security, energy sovereignty and iwi-owned circular economies within the village. She is the Climate Change Coordinator at Te Arawa Lakes Trust and an active, mem an active member of Te Ununga O Kea, the Te Arawa Climate Change Working Group. So, welcome, Lani. Kia tēnā koutou. Ai ko Lani te reo kutu o tūmua, o nga ati whakaui ki o hino tū. Um, as Fisher said, I'm Climate Change Coordinator at Te Arawa Lakes Trust. And alongside its work managing our Te Arawa Lakes, Te Arawa Lakes Trust is also the umbrella organisation providing administration and facilitation support to Te Urumo Kea, the Te Arawa Climate Change Working Group, which is a voluntary collective of whānau, hapu and iwi climate change action champions, I'll call us, um, who developed Te Araki Kōpū, the Te Arawa Climate Change Strategy. Um, so, the Tarawa Climate Change Strategy identified six priority areas requiring our focused collective efforts towards immediate planning, resource and action to ensure our whānau and hapu resilience and adaptability to the potential impacts of climate change. And these six priority areas were regaining our water, food and energy security, restoring our indigenous biodiversity and circular economies, and ensuring our whānau, hapu and iwi are able to make, uh, to undertake adaptation planning and resilience building and achieve la land use change and practices within our catchments, Maimaketu, Kitongareo, um, from in, in our tribal, er, tribal lands between Maketu and Tongareo, which um, we, as we all know is not easy to achieve. Um, so right now I'm just going to share with you the vision of Te Aroa in this time of climate change. Our rivers and lakes are clean, we can drink from them, swim in them, water our gardens from them, and our families can once again supplement our meals and show our manaakitanga to our manuhiri by providing freshwater kaimwana on tables at our marae. Our cherished food basket, where our fresh water meets the moana nui kiwa at Maketu and Uruwaihi is restored and protected through appropriate land use within the catchment our wetlands and indigenous rainforests are rebuilt. Our lands, nahere and waterways are pest free. Our indigenous ecosystems are thriving and our taonga species flourishing. The connections between our communities and our natural environment are re-established. We gather kai and rongoa and actively spend time in these spaces as part of everyday living 
whether for relaxation, fun, exercise, healing, learning, or while performing green jobs as part of an established green economy. All land use is determined with the health and well-being of our soils, waterways, and indigenous ecosystems prioritised. Our Farno, including those displaced by climate change, live in healthy homes on our Papakainga lands. Rotorua city and suburbs are supported by green, biophilic, water-sensitive infrastructure and have been reshaped to support carless communities with easy access to all necessary services and amenities such as schools, shops, playgrounds and green spaces. Our places of significance such as Wahi Tapu and cultural heritage sites are recognised and respected. Growing, harvesting and eating our own nutritious kai is a normal part of our children's lives. We eat fruit from trees growing on front lawns like we used to, harvest vegetables from home and community gardens to supplement our family meals. Our whanau and communities eat predominantly locally grown foods and our food systems allow the easy sharing of kai amongst ourselves with other hapu and iwi and between other communities across Aotearoa. In areas with access to geothermal, our whanau and communities use our ngāwha to heat our homes, cook our kai and bathe in. Every rooftop has solar panels and we share power with our neighbours and across our communities based on need. Our hapu and iwi utilise the wind, water and sun across our lands to produce extra power for our marae and other collective usage. Our people work for iwi owned and operated businesses making up food and resource circular economies at marae and community level. There is no waste in our environment. We reduce, we use, we clear, we build, we furbish, we sell, we cycle and compost everywhere we live, learn, work, gather and play. Our families understand the changes that climate change may bring. They are emotionally and spiritually prepared for change. Our communities are safe from rising rivers, lakes, seas and the changing weather. They are resilient, adaptive, ready to work together to mitigate any impacts and are prepared with emergency management strategies and appropriate resources. This is the future vision of the indigenous people Mai Maketu Ki Tongariro, Te Aroa Ahu Hawaiki, past, present and future generations of Te Aroa, secure and well. So how does that relate and what does that mean for any housing plan change, infrastructure strategy and also to do a future development strategy? Well, for Te Aroa, that means any future housing, infrastructure and development plans need to enable community resilience to the potential impacts of climate change by supporting sustainable water and energy management and use, accommodating local food growing and sharing, restoring indigenous ecosystems, biodiversity and our connections with nature, and enabling local circular economies through policy and infrastructure. Upgrading to biophilic, water-sensitive storm and wastewater infrastructure will also go some way to protecting our homes and communities from the potential impacts of inland flooding. Rotorua Lakes Council has initi initiated workshops with mana whenua, the people of the land, to discuss the housing plan change and Rotorua future development strategy. RLC wants to talk with Iwi about Tarawa supporting a council plan that describes where future growth will occur, identifies where and when cultural council infrastructure will be provided to support that growth, and it must have a statement of iwi and hapu aspirations for urban development. In this time of climate change, some of the things that Tarawa Fano and hapu want to talk with council about include the following. The pros and cons of the medium and high density compact housing that council envisions for Rotorua that have been identified nationally and internationally on the health and wellbeing of communities and natural environments. How te ao Māori, papakainga and community communal living aspects are being built into housing design guidelines because after all papakainga are a proven way of supporting our ability to live collectively with less and care for our own families and communities. 
we want to talk about iwi working in partnership with council to determine how many people we can realistically support in Rotorua city and surrounds, given that, given that our rivers, lakes and much of our lands are already polluted due to outdated and unsustainable city infrastructure and linear local economic systems. Uh, what policy and infrastructure is needed to support the establishment and development of circular economies at marae and community level, community level locally. The relocation of industry away from all waterways being written into policy and budgeted for within the district's 30 to 50 year plans. Mapping, planning and budgeting for the upgrading of Rotorua's stormwater wastewater and waste management systems to ensure iwi aspirations outlined within Te Tuapapa o Ngāwai o Tarawa and council obligations to implement the mana o te wai are achieved within the district's 30 to 50 year plans. RLC partnering with Tarawa to lobby for increased te kōkiri housing repair funding to ensure Rotorua's current housing stock are healthy, efficient, energy efficient homes with adequate envelope insulation ensuring a Rotorua future development strategy meaningfully aligns with the Tarawa Climate Change Strategy, Rotorua Climate Action Plan and Bay of Plenty Regional Council Climate Action Plan, and how any future developments will need to contribute to carbon neutral energy, transport and resource use while also being adaptable to both current and future climate patterns. And those, that's not my whole list, that's just a few of the things that we would like to talk about. In a nutshell, Tarawa wants to partner with both local and regional councils to identify, most importantly, the systems change that are required, systems changes that are required locally, agreed priorities and shared action plans, inclusive of timelines, milestones, equitable resourcing and expected outputs, and to align any housing plan change, infrastructure strategy, and or to do a future development plan with those shared adaptation plans. Thank you.